Hi, Richard Steenen here. Welcome to this Security Current uh, video cast. And uh, I'm talking with Mark Rash, who's a renowned uh, cyber legal expert, attorney, of course, uh, former um, Department of Justice. And uh, we had to get this together on uh, Monday, December 14th, because of all the news that broke on Sunday, uh, the 13th about hacks, uh, successful hacks uh, attributed to the Russian SRV, so Cozy Bear APT-29. Um, by Sunday evening, it was known to have been uh, targeting the Commerce Department and uh, a branch of the Commerce Department, as well as Treasury. That was big enough news as it was. Um, just about an hour ago, we learned that DHS is among those that have been uh, successfully targeted. So, Mark, what was your initial reaction when you heard this all going down? Well, it's interesting. The first thing I heard, of course, like everybody else did, is about the targeting of FireEye. And yep. that was big enough news because if you really want to get infiltration into lots of different organizations, you infiltrate an organization that has high-level privileges within those entities. That's number one. And number two, the thing that they were targeting at FireEye was hacker tools, right? specialized tools <clears throat> that FireEye was using. That's the second thing is you want to get into various organizations. You use the most sophisticated tools there are to get into those organizations. But what we've learned subsequently is that uh, obviously uh, that the, uh, the, Ru the Russian intelligence services uh, are targeting various U.S. government organizations, something that we've only known for about what's today. Today is Monday, uh, <laughs> 25, 30 years. Right. What, we, what we're learning, however, is how sophisticated, how successful, and more importantly, how targeted these attacks are. And I think that's the key word here is targeted. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about that sophistication because, you know, everyone who's breached says it was a sophisticated attacker uh, because, of course, they've got defenses against the unsophisticated ones. Uh, but when you start reading the details and particularly how the actual attack vector came in through a compromise of uh, a, a network management solutions company called SolarWinds, um, it meets my definition of sophisticated. Well, it does and it doesn't. I mean, the, the most obvious vector to try to break into things is a vector which already has a trusted relationship right. with the target. Right. And that's number one. And the second thing is that the most obvious way is to spoof yourself as that trusted relationship, which means a spoof, spoofed credential. Now, the way they spoofed the credential may have been sophisticated. Yeah, but the compromising is, or, or spoofing right. a signing uh, certificate, that's right. pretty good. That's pretty good. And it's pretty good because it's hard to do. And the reason it's hard to do is because that is an entree into everywhere that that signature is accepted. So it's like getting a universal ID that allows you in lots of places. That ID may be hard to forge, but once you have forged it, you are in all the places that accept that ID. Now, as near as I can tell, it wasn't as sophisticated as the flame malware that actually did a uh, MD5 hash collision in order to spoof a Microsoft update server. Thank you very much, NSA. Um, but it sounds like they were able to steal signing certificates from a SAML assertion uh, for solar winds, which seems pretty sophisticated, but it means they got into the active directory of solar winds, it sounds like. Well, this, this gets into a whole question of whether, whether we trust updates or don't trust updates. And both of us are old enough to remember the days when you would get an update and it would say, there is a new update, would you like to install? And you had three choices, yes, no, or let me think about it, let me yeah. examine it. Remind me and later. we would always, all our security people would say, let me examine it. Then we'd wait 24, 48 hours, whatever, see if it harmed anybody else. And if it didn't, we would accept it. Well, then we realized we were spending our entire day just installing patches and installing updates. So everybody's moved to the idea of automatically installing all patches and all updates, which is good for convenience, but it creates a vector for attacks. Yeah, as we saw with Nat Petya only two years ago, which used exactly that means of spreading widely. And the alternative, of course, is this whole philosophy that an unpatched or unupdated system is 
vulnerable, but one that has all the patches and all the updates is less vulnerable and more secure. And of course, that's not always true. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I'm, I quite often rail against the idea of even vulnerability management, right? Because even if you did it perfectly, you would only be patched against everything except zero day vulnerabilities, which are always going to be used. Right, right. And, and the truth is every vulnerability is a zero day vulnerability until it's discovered right. and patched. That's right. So, uh, and, you know, one of the things about this is the idea that you need to think like a hacker. And unfortunately, banks, insurance companies, government agencies have a tendency to think as regulators. Am I compliant? Do I meet the standards? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Right. Um, so it would be like having a checklist when you left your house. Did I close the doors? Did I lock the windows? Did I lock the door? As opposed to saying, if I want to break into my house, how would I do it? Right, right. Yep. Unfortunately, I think about that way too much. Luckily, I'm always home now. So all I need is a baseball bat. Yep. On either side, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get in or to get out. Or to get out. Good point. So uh, here's a question, especially about uh, federal agencies, because I tend to treat banks, most banks, the big banks, like they know what they're doing now, finally. Um, but so uh, DHS issued a emergency direction or something. What are they calling it? A um, emergency directive 2101. Uh, for mitigating the solar winds Orion code compromise. And my initial reaction, because I just saw the tweeting, was, you know, they they ask every agency to immediately cut off and shut down all usage of solar winds. And I go, well, wait a minute, that's a primary tool for network management, configuration management, and capturing traces of packets flowing across your network. Um, so it seemed like not a very good response, but in reading the entire thing, I'm going, okay, this is pretty detailed what you should do. I'm just concerned that most agencies won't be able to do the forensics they ask you to do. Um, they gave them until noon today to report if they found any of these indicators of compromise on their networks. All this sounded like way overreach for most agencies. Well, that's the problem is that you have, first of all, if you're a large agency like the Department of Defense, you have so many different components and, and bureaus and agencies uh, underneath you that coordinating this is a full-time job. It, it right. is lit almost literally turning an aircraft carrier, okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing is if you're a small agency, like the Voice of America <laughs> or uh, the Agency for International Development, or particularly a small independent agency, almost all of your IT security staff is outsourced. These oh. are not employees. These are government contractors. And one of the problems is that you're using government contractors, They're the same government contractors who are being used by the Department of Defense and by the CIA and these other agencies. So they're scrambling right now to try to patch vulnerabilities in all these government agencies and the problem is they don't they don't really have a priority list of which ones to do first when i saw this my first question and my first thought was i got to ask mark rash what authority does cisa have inside dhs to order all these agencies to take these actions well, they have regulatory authority and they have uh, advisory authority. They can't, they, they don't have any sanctions. They can't, they can't impose fines or anything like that. And fining the government is like, you know, taking money from one pocket and right. putting it in another pocket. Right. Uh, so they, they have advisory authority and the like, uh, but they don't have a lot of teeth in what they can do. Uh, but they, they do have a lot of persuasive authority and people do listen to them. The real question is whether they have the resources to do what CISA is asking them to do. Right. The, uh, and now, of course, we discover that uh, DHS is, according to reporting from Reuters, uh, DHS um, is, has been compromised by the same uh, campaign, I guess. Um, so obviously they took their own advice and started looking for these types of compromises. 
this goes to the whole thing about about with COVID. If you do more testing, you're going to find more cases. That's if you start right. looking for <laughs> vulnerabilities, you're going to find vulnerabilities. The yeah. answer to that is keep looking, not stop looking. That's right. Um, That's right. And so that that to the extent that we find this and we find other things as a result, it's a good thing. But again, while you're out scrambling for to respond to one vulnerability or one threat, is the best time for attackers to install the next one. Yeah, move on. Yeah. So I understand the um, Solar Winds, who had a page up uh, bragging about their customers, um, where they listed the fact that they have 425 of 500 Fortune uh, 500 companies. Um, they have all branches of the military, the Pentagon. Uh, the State Department and the Office of the President of the United States as customers. They took that down today. <laughs> they didn't like well, people that, talking about it. That doesn't really help them much because I'm looking uh, at the list just as you are yeah, uh, yeah. right now. And, and the, the point is that yes, by them publishing the list now, they're saying here's a roadmap of people that you can now attack. Yep. The truth is that the fancy bear already has this roadmap right and hopefully in the very near future this roadmap will be useless yeah yeah and they they uh i guess they filed something with the sec today as they need to when something like this happens and they claim only about eighteen thousand of their customers would have been exposed to these these uh, vulnerabilities, but 18,000 is enough to include some good targets. Well, and you say 18,000 customers, okay, you could have a customer being the Department of Defense or right. a customer being the United States Air Force or uh, uh, a customer being Cisco. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or AT&T. Yeah. Well, what about the customers of these customers? Okay. That's number yep. one, because remember, as you know, that the whole point here is get in, get credentialed, elevate your credentials, and then do what it is you want to do. Yeah. All we're speaking about here is the vector to get in. Right. And then it, it surprised me quite a bit to see the OPSEC that the attackers use. Once they're in, according to FireEyes, excellent write-up, they didn't uh, um, use you know, uh, manufacturer credentials or something like that, they stole additional credentials on the inside that would make them look like a regular user. That's right. And, that, and that's the thing. And, and all the things you do for IOCs, for indicators of compromise, are aimed at, at preventing the, them from getting in, getting the credentials and elevating. But if they've already gotten the credentials, now what you're faced with is the, the prospect of having to reissue and revalidate credentials across an entire enterprise. I think the real interesting issue from a legal standpoint is what is the liability of solar winds? What is their duty to their customers? What recourse do the customers have against solar winds? Uh, and what is the duty of the customers to prevent this from happening via solar winds? And what's their liability to their customers? And yeah, the answer I to that is I have no idea. Yeah, we could find out if it's taken to court. Right. Um, you know, you like to think that uh, solar winds could have avoided this in the first place, but we won't know just what mistakes they made that allowed it. But I, I'm sure enterprise software deliverers, um, uh, manufacturers, Cisco included, will have to up their game when it comes to how they do updates, software updates. That's right. I mean, this is the, that's the interesting problem is it's not the underlying software and it's not the update. It is the process by which the update right. is validated and right. then and then pushed out. That's the problem. But remember, you know, with everything else, the the, the hackers, the attackers only have to find one vector to get in and you have to yeah. defend against every one of them. So you that's can't right. necessarily even say even if this is a major vulnerability that created a major problem um, that um, that uh, solar winds or any of these people were per se negligent and failing to adhere to a reasonable standard of care. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just kind of uh, anxiously looking forward to the rest of the week and the rest of the year as more and more of these dominoes fall because they're bound to 
Um, yeah, what'll be but, interesting is not to see who who got ha uh, who was affected. Oh, yeah. It'll be interesting to see the much smaller list of entities that were not affected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they do all these checks and report uh, positively to DHS, it, we're good. They might feel left out, like they don't have anything worth stealing. <laughs> Well, the other thing is, is once I once I'm into a large organization, st stolen an entire database of credentials, which we don't know whether that happened or not. Those credentials can frequently be redeployed to other enterprises as well. Right. If a intelligence agency had a, a windfall like this, right? So we, you know, historically there have been sources that have just opened doors for a spy agency. Um, but if they make a major inroad that gives them an attack vector into 18,000 organizations, can they staff up to uh, actually exploit all those opportunities? You're talking about Fancy Bear? Yeah. Or, ABT uh, Cozy Bear, yeah. Cozy yeah. Bear, I'm sorry. Cozy yeah. Bear. Yeah. Um, you mean it may be an embarrassment of riches yeah. for, the, for the Russian intelligence yeah. agencies? Exactly. I mean, if you have an industrial opportunity, can you, you know, move on it and automate the processing and get the footholds? And Most of this stuff is done manually. It's, it's still yeah. the idea that, that you have some caseworker, uh, you know, in St. Petersburg or Moscow who's overseeing this and they have these opportunities. A lot of you automate the process of breaking in and grabbing credentials and stealing stuff, but the analysis is pr pretty much done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, the real problem is once you're in, you know, now what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. And, and so that's, that's why these, these types of attacks are really devastating. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering the, uh, you started by talking about, or I've seen other people talking about that it might've been a little bit of overreach to attack FireEye, right? Is that's, you know, once they discovered what you were doing, they would get to the root cause. And they're the ones that are called in for uh, all, all, all these agencies when they get attacked, right? The Mandiant team. Right. Um, so it seemed to be a mistake to, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if poking the bear is the right metaphor to use in this case. The bear poking <laughs> someone else. Yeah, or poking the eagle, or you know, it's almost like going after the NSA. You don't want to do that unless you've done your homework. <clears throat> well, as as uh, <clears throat> the the uh, Japanese uh, general said that after uh, Pearl Harbor, he says, "I I fear we have awoken the, the sleeping giant." Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say FireEye, obviously, they had the initial vulnerability, but they've done a pretty good job since then in getting the word out and, and yep. basically explaining what's going on. Um, but then again, it's in their interest to have people concerned about security and wanting to do something about it. And I'm not being cynical here. I just think it's the right thing to do. Right. Uh, but what they were after with FireEye was somewhat different than what they were after with these other victims. Sure. FireEye was really targeted, targeting FireEye and targeting their tools. Right. So right. now we don't have to look just for closing the barn door uh, with respect to the initial vulnerability. We now have to close the barn door and look for any vulnerabilities to any of FireEye's tools that were stolen as well. Right. Right, right. Which thankfully they've published the IOCs on all of their tool set, which is yeah. But cool. we're assuming that any victim now knows. Remember, this is not just vulnerabilities to FireEye customers. These are vulnerabilities to anybody anywhere in the world to these tools. So yeah. now, if you're running a, a small website for a coffee shop in Kuala Lumpur, is it reasonable for, to expect that you're going to examine how FireEye's tools worked and whether you have vulnerabilities to that? No. Well, no. I sure hope FireEye doesn't have any eternal blues in their toolkits. <laughs> well, we, we, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I have not even looked at what the, uh, the tools that were compromised for FireEye, but I yep. assume they're reasonably sophisticated. Yep. And luckily, uh, Microsoft's already issued updates. So I think uh, Windows Defender will catch a lot of this uh, right off the bat. Uh, Solar Winds has got patches available. Just how do you determine that they're okay now that we don't trust patches? That's right. And and there's a good deal of the sound of uh, barn doors being closed uh, without <laughs> yeah. any horses uh, within the barn. <laughs> That's right. All right. Fantastic, Mark. I'm glad we had a chance to touch base right when this was breaking and okay. continues to break. It, it will continue. And, and, you know, the basic takeaway here is that you have to be constantly vigilant and multi-layered. Uh, and uh, and uh, trust nobody, including yep. us.
Yeah. 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 Don't trust us. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Bert. Thank you.